All right, welcome everyone to Gnostic NYC. Uh, our topic for this month is Bogomil's Buggery and Bump and Uglies, Attitude Towards Gender and Sexuality in Gnosticism Ancient and Modern. Uh, because a short title just would not do. Um, <laughs> if you are watching us live, please, uh, or watching us rather recorded, because we are unable to go live today, please feel free to leave comments and questions on the YouTube, uh, in the YouTube comments, and we'll respond to those as we get them. Uh, stick around at the end where we will discuss uh, upcoming stuff at Gnostic NYC and, uh, and you can find out how to join us in person. Um, but let's just get right into it. Um, I wanted to start off uh, by talking about um, the way that the Gnostics, uh, especially the ancient Gnostics, handled uh, gender uh, in general. Um, the two kind of large schools of Gnosticism, the Sethians and the Valentinians, um, Used a lot of gender symbolism in their uh, in their in their writings. Um, so to start off with the Sethians, the um, the first emanation from the Invisible Father is Barbello, who is known by a lot of different titles, but is often called Mother uh, in a in a triad of Father, Mother, and Son, and um, she's also called mother, father, and thrice male. So there's a lot of interesting and complex kind of symbolism around that figure in Scythian <laughs> mythology. Not just, uh, you know, from like one group to another, but even within the same texts. Um, this figure just is known by a lot of different names, and that actually leads to some confusion for new Gnostics when they're reading these, uh, these texts. Uh, you know, it's hard enough keeping the Gnostic concepts uh, you know, straight in your head, and then when the same figure gets called by thirty-five different names in the same uh, five-page text, you get uh, you get some you know some confused looks, and that happens quite a bit. Um, but anyway, so uh, Barbello is, as I said, the first emanation. But not only is she uh, considered mother, she is also androgynous. Um, and, and that comes, I think, when, when they talk about mother-father, they're talking about this androgyny, but they're also talking about um, the kind of close relationship that Barbello has with the Invisible Father. Um, the figure of Barbello is, is never specifically called androgynous in the Secret Gospel of John, the Apocrypha of John, but she's lumped, she's lumped into the other four emanations that come right after her um, that are specifically called androgynous. Um, forethought and um, the other ones that I didn't bring my notes for that. But yeah, if you check out last uh, last Wednesday's talk, and you can get all of that. But so the androgynous pentad of the aeons of the father, at least five, Barbello and the four emanations that come from her, um, and as a result of them being androgynous, are also called the decad of the aeons, aeons of the father. So you get a lot of this uh, symbolism very early on in the creation mythos of the Sethians. Um, and then as the emanations process goes on and, and, and goes further down this, this ladder, um, the last aeon, Sophia, is very specifically female. Um, the, the androgyny is gone, and these are now gendered you know, beings, aeons. Uh, but the only one specifically mentioned in the, uh, in the secret, uh, secret Book of John, as in this group anyway, as being gendered, is Sophia. Um, and of course, Sophia being a Greek word for wisdom, wisdom. Um, is a feminine noun. And as you know, the, the ancient uh, classical languages had gendered nouns. Every noun was either male or female. So Sophia being a, fe a feminine noun, um, this being is feminine. Um, the reason why that's important is because when she tries to create without her counterpart, um, without asking the permission of the invisible spirit, the invisible father, um, this is what creates the demiurge, this is what creates the split between the pleroma and the cosmos. And so um, you get a parallel a heavenly parallel of the earthly fall. So you get this this same process that happens, quote unquote, twice in the in in the creation story of the uh, of the Sethians, even though the second time it isn't really a fall <coughs> in the same sense that it is in the kind of orthodox Christian uh, story. So you get the when when the Sethians talk about the fall, they are talking about this error of Sophia. All right. Um, 
and again, very specifically female in this case. Um, and then, of course, the Valentinians in their cosmology, they have various pairs of aeons that are male and female that are a syzygy, which is another one of these delightful Gnostic words that we get to use. Syzygy. It's spelled with Z's and Y's. <laughs> Is that chromosomes? <laughs> nope. No, there's no Z chromosome that I'm aware of. Um, Zygote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's something like mitosis. Yeah, Zygote. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so that's that's kind of androgyny. We can go on and on, but let's move on. Um, Gnostics were famous for having female teachers, the ancient Gnostics. Um, specifically, Mary was was very revered. Mary Magdalene was very revered by the early Gnostics. Um, <coughs> in fact, there are whole texts that are attributed to her. Um, there is the Gospel of Mary. Mary is the primary teacher. Um, when uh, the Savior comes back after the resurrection uh, and talks to the apostles, uh, and then he takes off. And kind of early in the story, he just he takes off. He's he's like, yeah, see you guys. I got stuff to do. And then the uh, the rest of the apostles were like, oh no, what are we gonna do? We have nobody to teach us anymore. And Mary says, don't worry about it. I got this. And so she goes on and on and tells all of the secrets that the Savior told her. And it's um, very common among the Gnostics to have Mary Magdalene play that role um, as apostle to the apostles. Um, in the Gospel of Philip, Mary is, uh, as I'm sure everybody in America is aware, <laughs> Mary is the companion of Jesus in the Gospel of Philip. And, um, and there's smooching, and that's Thomas's note here, that, she, that they smooch. Um, let's see. Uh, smooching? <laughs> yeah. Um, da, 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 I, the, I don't have the exact quote here, but the, there's, um, in, Ber in Berger Pearson's talk on the uh, um, on the, the Sethians, yeah, I think I think it's on the Sethians. He talks about this. Oh no, no, he talks specifically about Mary Magdalene. Yeah, that 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 one that they just put up. Um, uh, that the uh, that Jesus kissed her often on the, and then there's a hole in the manuscript. <laughs> but of course, Dan Brown obviously knows exactly what they. Yeah. Mean, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, of course. He kissed her often on the mouth, which is a perfectly fine interpretation of that particular sure. hole in the manuscript. What's it? But it is an interpretation, and, and I don't think I don't think most people who read the Da Vinci Code are aware of that. That that's there are a lot of things people who read the Da Vinci Code aren't aware of. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of things I'm not aware of, so I can't fault them. Like that's fiction. So anyway, so in the Gospel of Philip, as we continue, um, Mary is also linked to wisdom, to Sophia, and. Um, Let's see, the quote is, as for the wisdom who is called the barren, she is the mother of the angels, the companion of the whole, Mary Magdalene, another whole, uh, loved her more than all the disciples, okay, so it does have this here, and used to kiss her often on her mouth hole. Uh, not her mouth hole, but hole. And, then, and the rest <laughs> of the disciples, another, another okay. one. I'll use the word lacuna, which is the actual, you know, kind of fun word. <laughs> <laughs> they said to him, why do you love her more than all of us? The Savior answered and said to them, Why do I not love her like you? When a blind man and one who sees are both together in darkness, they are no different from one another. When the light comes, that he who sees will see the light, and he who is blind will remain in darkness. So the Savior here is saying, Mary is the one who has the sight, and she's going to lead all you blind jerks around once the sun comes up. So, uh, and again, this primacy of Mary Magdalene as the quintessential Gnostic teacher. All right, so um, there are uh, a number of there are a number of terms that are used in all of theology, all of Christian theology, and then some specific to Gnostic theology that are that are gendered. So, for example, we already talked about the invisible Father in the Sethian cosmology, uh, the Father. You know, so these are um, male kind of patristic uh, titles given to the ultimate divine, um, the ineffable, all right? And so as human beings, we need to put language on things. And this particular symbol is, is the one that has stuck for that particular uh, concept of divinity. And then, of course, you get to the mother, all right? The mother-father, as we talked about earlier. And then you have the son. So what, in especially in Sethian cosmology, you have a mother, a father, and a son, or a father, a mother, and a son. Um, and then, in, obviously, in Orthodox Christianity, you have a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is typically feminine. Um, in both Hebrew and Greek, and I meant to look this up earlier. Shekhinah. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Shekhinah and the Numa are both feminine nouns. So, again, the feminine noun for the term, the spirit, <coughs> becomes the gender of the personified being of the uh, thing. It's like calling a boat she, I guess, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit more deep than that. Um, <coughs> And then, of course, so you've got those kind of gendered language uh, uh, things that are happening in, uh, in Gnosticism and in, in Orthodox Christianity. And then the soul. The soul gets a lot of treatment in Gnostic myths. Uh, the soul happens to be female in almost all cases, except for one pretty glaring example, which is from the Acts of Thomas, um, which is the, uh, the Hymn of the Pearl, where the soul, in the guise of a prince, leaves his kingdom, for some reason takes off all his clothes, leaves his kingdom, and goes to Egypt, which is code for the dark land where, you know, people, ignorant people live, which I don't think is a reflection of the Egyptian people at the time. No. I think that, the, that Egypt is a symbol for the world in a lot of these. Exile. Which yeah. 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 they were bondage and slavery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. So, um, so the soul travels uh, and then uh, finds this pearl, or, well, gets lost and caught up in all of the worldly stuff, has to be reminded by his parents, his, his uh, fraternal mother and father, you know, his, the eternal mother and father, the, the king and queen. Um, they send, uh, they send a, a scroll that is also a bird, and it flies down, also an eagle that flies down and reminds him of what he's doing. He goes, he gets the pearl from the dragon, he returns, he puts his clothes back on, everything's great. <laughs> So, um, but in most cases, the soul is female. Um, in most uh, in most myths and languages, um, but again, these kind of concepts, especially uh, spirit and soul, they they get much less treatment as personified beings than the other parts of this um, this uh, this whole theological family. Um, I don't. I'm not familiar with. I meant to ask you, Bishop. It, it, I've never seen a daughter figure specifically in, in this thing. Okay, all right. So, so anyway, and I, again, when you treat these from the culture that they grew out of, um, they were certainly very uh, male-centered. Uh, yeah. You know, and and people give the Gnostics a lot of credit from a modern point of view. Uh, when looking back at the ancient Gnostics, they say, you know, look, they, they treat Mary Magdalene as the primary teacher, and they did. And so, uh, it's entirely possible that the ancient Gnostics were a lot more progressive than their, you know, than their, their strictly male-only counterparts, you know. And, and the truth is, we don't have a lot of examples of what their actual daily life was like, so it's tough to say. But um, certainly from their writings, and from the way they treated the subject, they had a lot of respect for women, and especially Mary Magdalene, um, and that and that language transfers over, and so that's why I think you'll see more father, mother, son symbolism, mm -hmm. and and this this kind of respect for both genders and the use of gender as symbolic language, and, and very specifically the syzygies and the the androgenies and all of those things. Um, the Gospel of Thomas has a couple of things to say about gender. Uh, da, 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 da. Jesus saw, uh, Logion 22, Jesus saw some babies nursing. He said to his disciples, these nursing babies are like those who enter the Father's kingdom. They said to him, then shall we enter the Father's kingdom as babies? Jesus said to them, when you make the two into one, and you make the inner like the outer, and the outer like the inner, and the upper like the lower, and when you make the male and female into a single one, so the male will not be male, nor the female female. When you make the eye in place of an eye, a hand in place of a hand, a foot in place of a foot, and an image in place of an image, then will you enter the kingdom. So, this is some really juicy stuff. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in here, but I think essentially what they're talking about here is creating a mystical androgyny that that unification of the higher and the lower, um, and to make the male and female into a single one, 
Uh -huh. Right. We're talking about the soul and the spirit and the body <laughs> all uniting into a single one um, as the original condition of all the world, you know, of all of existence was once as part of that single one. Um, and so then you will enter the kingdom. So uh, that one's kind of, there's a lot to think about there. I'm not going to go into a, a great deal of detail. You could spend probably <coughs> a year thinking about that every day for an hour and you never come close to it. Um, but uh, then, okay, so let's go further down the, the Gospel of Thomas. Um, the uh, Patterson-Meyer translation of the Gospel of Thomas has this in a little bracket saying this particular saying was probably added at a later date. Um, and maybe it was. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a textual scholar. But uh, this one is Logion 114. Simon Peter said to them, Make Mary leave us, for females don't deserve life. Jesus said, Look, I will guide her to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you male. For every female who makes herself male will enter into the kingdom of heaven. So a lot of people read this and say, oh, sure, you know, of course, you know, the, the ancient, you know, the people who were walking around in the desert 2,000 years ago, of course they think that females don't deserve life. I, I think that's a bit simplistic. Um, you know, I think that there's more going on there than just a literal reading would, would imply. So I think, it's, again, it's talking about this... Um, well, I think two things are happening. I think, one, the people who wrote this part of the text, and I think this is maybe a good argument for why it was added later, but I think the people who wrote this particular part of the text were talking about Peter's group. You know, the people who were taught by Peter who were taught by Peter, the people who were taught by Peter. You know, so like the, the Petrine community, wherever that happened to be, probably Rome at, at this point. And so... <coughs> Peter says, make Mary leave us. So it's specifically Peter, um, because the people who are writing this are on the Mary Magdalene side of the fence, mm -hmm. and they're bashing the people who are on the Peter side of the fence. You know, they're saying, look at this jerk. <laughs> All right? You know, and so Peter's saying, Mary can't be one of us. Yeah. And Jesus is saying, Mary is one of us, and look, I'm going to do this specific thing for her. I'm going to provide her this mystical union, this and this mystical androgyny that is going to make her better than you. So, um, so I think those two specific things that are happening in this passage make this a worthy, you know, part of the Gospel of Thomas. Whether it was added later or not, it, it's almost it's almost not important. But it, it comes down to us in the versions that we have. So I think that's pretty good. All right. Uh, let's move on to sexuality and attitudes towards sex amongst the early groups. So uh, celibacy. Well, okay. So Irenaeus the Jerk refers to Gnostics is in a couple of different ways. Um, he talks about Gnostics being libertines and know, being sexually promiscuous and, and uh, indiscriminate. Um, but then he also talks about other Gnostic groups who are very, very strictly ascetic about sex. Um, and, you know, other writers write different things about different groups. And I think that's probably because there were so many different attitudes uh, among all of those different groups. So a couple of them that practice celibacy, um, the Marcionites, uh, definitely were absolutely celibate um, and, uh, and, and were very much a world-hating dualist kind of group. The, the, the group you think of when you think of world-hating dualists. Um, and there are a couple of other examples, but we won't necessarily get into those. And then much later, the Cathars, um, who learned from the Bogomils, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, the Cathar perfecti, there were, there were two levels of being Cathar. Two levels? Right. Two levels of being Cathar. You were a kind of a hanger-on, or you were a, a, a perfecti, the perfected. All right? um, it was a, after undergoing a ritual called the consolamentum, you became a perfecti, and then you were expected to be celibate. You were also expected to be a vegetarian and a couple of other things. It was a very strict kind of ascetic lifestyle, and as a result, there weren't a lot of them. Um, there were an awful lot of Cathar, we were told, who converted on or near their deathbeds, you know, when they figured it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> but, uh, you know, ah, 
I'll eat I'll eat beets and, and potatoes for two weeks before I die. Yes, or whatever. Um, but anyway, but that was a uh, another group that was very specifically uh, expected celibacy of its of its uh, of its adherents. Now, there were a couple of groups who were also considered pretty sexually promiscuous and out there. One of them. Uh, was the Carpocratians, and, and to what extent the Carpocratians were actually libertines is kind of a matter of debate, but um, you have uh, these, I think it's, it's at least the, the theology that, that leads to their accusations of being libertines is at least internally consistent. Um, you have a group that one of their core beliefs, according to some of these uh, heresy hunter folks, was that in order for their soul to be liberated, they had to experience everything that they could possibly experience on Earth. And a lot of those things in included sexual weirdness. So um, that was a, one of the accusations that the Carpocratians got. Deserved or not, I don't know, um, but it seems to be, uh, if, you, if you look at it, if you look at it from that point of view, it seems like it could be at least possible. Um, let's see. the. Uh, Oh, Thomas, this is your quote here from Codex Wikipedia. Um, followers of Basilides uh, were possibly a libertine group. Uh, let me read this here. Clement, Clement and Epiphanius did preserve a passage of the supposed writings of Basilides' son and successor, Isidore. Is, do you think that's how you pronounce that? Which consuls free satisfaction of sensual desires in order that the soul may find peace in prayer. Whether this writing is authentic or not is to be debated. Modern scholars tend to take a view that while there may have been cases of licentiousness in both Orthodox Christian and Gnostic Christian circles, there is inadequate evidence to convict Basilides and his followers generally of this charge. Um, although I think, again, the logic there is still kind of internally consistent. Uh, if you make a hard line between prayer and everything else, then everything else can intrude upon your prayer. So. If you want to be really, really, really focused on your prayer, then you better have eaten a full meal and you know had some fun with your lady friend, and then gone and done your prayer, uh, and then you won't be thinking about that, uh, you know. So maybe it's true. Who knows? <coughs> um, many people consider uh, Paul, Saint Paul, to be a, uh, a Gnostic, and a lot of his works certainly have Gnostic -y influences. Um, and he was, uh, he was a fan of celibacy as well. He promoted celibacy for those who could, and then, but then on the side said, yeah, but I know that kind of sucks. So you guys, you guys over there, if you want to get married, go ahead, have fun, you know, with, with my blessing. <coughs> All right. So the Valentinians, I've got quite a bit here on the Valentinians because there's some interesting little um, points of view from some various different scholars, but generally the Valentinians had a pretty positive view of, ma a view of marriage. Um, marriage and by extension sexuality. Uh, so the Gospel of Philip um, says, Great is the mystery of marriage, for without it the world would not exist. And this kind of reflects the, the Valentinians kind of mitigated dualism of, yeah, the world's not awful. I mean, it could be worse. That's kind of what their attitude was towards the world. And, um, you know, so they, they're generally fans of it. Um, but they use the metaphor. They, they drove this metaphor home quite a bit. They had a, a, a lot of stuff in their writings about the bridal chamber. And, of course, they, they also had a, a ritual called the bridal chamber. Um, so this metaphor of the bridal chamber, of mystical union with the angel, the higher angel, um, is, is, is throughout, all, all over the uh, Valentinian writings. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, and this one is also from the Gospel of Philip. No one can know when the husband and wife have intercourse with one another, except the two of them. Indeed, marriage in the world is a mystery for those who have taken a wife. <coughs> if there is a hidden quality to the marriage of defilement, how much more is the undefiled marriage a true mystery? It is not fleshly, but pure. It belongs to, not to desire, but to the will. It belongs not to darkness or the, or the night, but to the day and the light. If a marriage is open to the public, it has become prostitution, and the bride plays the harlot not only when she is impregnated by another man, but even if she slips out of her bedroom and is seen. Let her show herself only 
to her father and her mother, and to the friend of the bridegroom and the sons of the bridegroom. These are permitted to enter every day into the bridal chamber, but let others yearn to listen to her voice and to, and to, enjoy, <clears throat> and to enjoy her ointment. Let them feed from the crumbs that fall from the table like the dogs. Bridegrooms and brides belong to the bridal chamber. No one shall be able to see the bridegroom with the bride unless he becomes such a one. <coughs> so, <coughs> if we're reading this in a literalist way, uh, which a lot of people have over the years, you can see that there is a th there's a reason why some scholars have come to the conclusion that this bridal chamber was a sexual ritual, like a sex magic kind of ritual. Uh, I don't think I'm on the side of that. I think I think this is more of a description of a mystical process. It sounds uh, like a These are symbols, yeah. exactly. Um, but anyway, let's talk about that. At the um, I, I don't know if it originates with uh, Jean-Yves Lelou, um, but he's he's certainly written a lot about that. You know, the, the bridal chamber as a sexual ritual. Um, he has translated a lot of these texts and he compares um, he compares the sacrament of the bridal chamber to aspects of Jewish mysticism um, which would develop later develop into the Kabbalah um, and the reason for his his interpretation of this is he saw the and in fact the line is up here um, I've lost it, but he his theory is that the um, that the children produced through the mystical sexual ritual of the bridal chamber would be pure children, and that uh, children conceived just the regular old way they'd be defiled, they'd be lesser, um, which I think speaks to the three part division of the Valentinian cosmology, um, which certainly plays into that. Whether the Valentinians saw the whole world of humanity actually divided into three separate types of people, or whether these types of people were actually states of being, I don't know. <coughs> I don't know how much scholarship has actually been done on that specifically. I think a modern view would certainly take the, and I, I, I know most modern Gnostics would take that in a states of being rather than, you know, you know, the, the five of us, six of us in this room, you know, where do we get it? Where are the Hylics? You know, those people out there on the street, you know, they're, oh, no, I'm sorry, where are the pneumatics? I screwed that up. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we are. Who knows? Um, but anyway, so we are the, we're the, we're the top. We're the cream of the crop. And everybody out there, you know, uh, you know. Then yeah. it becomes a caste system. Exactly. But I don't think it was intended that and way. And it may, it, it might way. have been intended that way. <laughs> we, the truth is we just don't know. But, <laughs> but if, so if you, if you think of the, the, the bridal chamber as a way to produce pneumatics, as a way to produce children who are automatically superior to everybody else. Then maybe that was that's a, it's a good it's a good reason to have a ritual sex magic cult as any. Um, that sounds like David Koresh. I don't really know much about. Well, he him. talked about how he was supposed to sire children who would have God's DNA. Ah, uh, well, all right. Um, so anyway, um, uh, so. Uh, the Gospel of Philip envisions, as Lulu points out, the Gospel of Philip envisions a sacred embrace, which is a sexual union based not on lust, but rather upon the spiritual blending of man and woman. He then distinguishes between mere procreation and creative engendering, in which the sacred embrace of a couple calls down a spark of the divinity to conceive a physical child, but with enhanced material, spiritual, spiritual potential. Without the sacrament of holy union, Leloup says, children may well be born, yet poorly conceived. The holiest goal is immaculate conceptions with pure intentions, i.e. giving freely an expression of creative generosity, a child desired for itself. Okay, so um, Leloup quotes, uh, has another couple of quotes here to back up his theories. Um, there are two trees growing in paradise. The one bears animals, the other bears men. Adam ate from the tree which bore animals. He became an animal, and he brought forth animals. And then later on, everyone who will enter into the bridal chamber will kindle the light. For blank, just as in marriages which are blank, happen at night, um, all those who participate in the sacred embrace will kindle the light. They will not beget people as they, 
uh, they will not beget as people do in ordinary marriages which take place in darkness. So, was the bridal chamber a sexual magic ritual? Yeah, I think it's unlikely, but it's certainly a possibility, and there certainly were groups, and still are groups, who have a sexual magic practice, which we'll briefly mention later. Um, that, uh, you know, that, that it doesn't make it too, too far outside the realm of possibility. Um, and then the Gospel of Thomas uh, says, uh, Logan 79, a woman who was in the crowd said to him, uh, lucky are the womb that bore you and the breast that fed you. And he said to her, lucky are those who have heard the word of the Father and have truly kept it. For there will be days when you say, lucky are the womb that has not conceived and the breast that have not given milk. So again, this is kind of a <clears throat> on the world hating side, if you want to think of it that way, that for people who uh, it, 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 this is a, a in, well, people have taken this as a uh, as an incitement to celibacy, so that you don't trap further sparks of light here on on Earth. But anyway, that's uh, just another just some more examples. So. My third section here, I have uh, against the Gnostics. So here we're going to talk about what all of the what all of the awful petty people throughout the centuries have had to say about the Gnostics. So, um, the um, all right, let's skip right down to the Bogomils. Okay, so the Bogomils were a um, were a Gnostic according to Wikipedia, which is an, an interesting kind of phrase that they give to them, a Gnostic religio-political sect founded in the, first, in the first Bulgarian Empire by the priest Bogomil during the reign of Tsar Peter I in the 10th century and probably arose what is today in the region of Macedonia. Um, the Bogomils are mostly known for being the group that inspired the Cathars in France uh, a little bit later. Um, but uh, the reason why we talk about them is, or in this lecture, is because um, in English the, we have the term buggery, which is, a, a, um, in, in specifically, it's a name for a crime, the crime of anal sex. Um, it was, it was, uh, it comes to the English language through the, the Catholic Church, who uh, took the word bug in French, and Donald will kick me in the face for pronouncing it like that, but, <laughs> um, which comes from Bulgar, Bulgarian, which was understood to mean the Bulgarians at the time. It first appears in English in 1330, um, though bugger in a sexual sense is not rec recorded until 1955. Uh, 1555. 1955 would be way too late to be using that term. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> but, um, but anyway, so here we have an example of a Gnostic group who has been painted by the heresy hunters as sexually promiscuous and specifically accusations of homosexuality. And Bog means God. Right, Bog means yeah. God, yes. Now in the days of the Orthodox Tsar Peter, there was a priest who was called Bogomil, yep. but who was a true Bogomil. Yeah. He was the first to sow heresy in the land of Bulgaria. Yep. Really? Yeah. Yeah. What is it? Whose text is that? I've forgotten. It's interesting. Yeah, you can find about all this stuff yeah. on Wikipedia. There's actually quite a bit known about this particular period of history. It wasn't uh -huh. really all that long ago. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so here's so this is kind of a typical example. We know more about it obviously because it was much much more recent than the ancient Gnostic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but again, <coughs> it. It's probably pretty unlikely that there was actual, you know, ritual homosexuality being practiced by the Bogomils. Um, that was a fairly standard trope that the, uh, the the Catholic Church would throw at groups they didn't like. Um, it's a standard trope thrown at every any unfashionable sect, starting with the apostles. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, so uh, I guess if it works. So the awful, awful Catholic Church didn't invent that. Sorry. No. 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 no absolutely not. Um, all right, so I, I have one last section here. We're doing pretty good for time. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what the modern Gnostics say about uh, about sexuality and gender. Um, 
Specifically from the Apostolic Johannite Church, um, we have a statement of principles that consists of a bunch of kind of little paragraphs where we talk about uh, the, the uh, you know, what the basic tenets of, of a Johannite spirituality is. And our last one uh, is we recognize the sacred flame to be present in all beings and therefore our offices are open to all humanity without discrimination on the basis of gender, race, societal status, or sexual orientation. Um, and this comes out of our theology uh, and, and not out of, you know, geez, it's 2012, wouldn't it be nice if we were all progressive and stuff. Um, which it is 2012 and it's nice to be all progressive and stuff, but, um, but again, we, the, the sacred flame, which is the term we use for that spark of the divine, that, that, that mystical union with, with the one, um, is present in every single human being. Uh, regardless of any other outside who's he what's it's so it would make very little sense from a Gnostic point of view to have any kind of discrimination for any of our sacraments any of our offices any of that stuff and I think that's a fairly common I mean I know it's certainly true of, of the Alexandria Gnostic Church or Bishop Thomas's church and I don't know a whole lot about some of the other Gnostic churches but I know the Ecclesia Gnostica certainly ordains women and, I, and they, they don't have any problems with, with homosexuality or anything like that. And um, I think Tal Rosamund's church ordains women too. Tal Rosamund's church does. ordains women as well. Starting with Tal Rosamund. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, this is a fairly common uh, trait of modern Gnosticism. Uh, and, I, and I think that it's, it's one of the reasons why I think a lot of people are, uh, you know, are, are digging what we're doing these it days. Started with our predecessor. Uh, Tal Valentine II. Oh, is that true? Who in it, it was? It, oh, this well, yes, absolutely. He started, it, and then it was lost to the Gnostic Church for a while. Yes. After the schism, but he, but from day one, um, from the establishment of the, of the Gnostic Church in 1890, you had uh, the Church was ruled by Sisyphes mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the Episcopate, a male bishop and a female Sophia. They were both addressed with the mystical uh, letter Tal in front of them. But the men were called bishops, the females were called Sophias. And that didn't last very long because of the, the schism that came later, which became the sort of a drift towards a more Catholic view of things under under Tosinesius and then under Bacot, but, but was restored in modern times by folks like the Ecclesiastes to kind of mm -hmm. tell us and then AGC, AJC. Yep, yep. Yep, okay, so um, when. Um, Gnosticism is most kind of known for its matter-spirit dualism, and it's that's another primary driver for, for how modern Gnostics view gender and sexuality. Um, if matter is one thing, spirit is a separate thing, or if spirit is everything and matter is a subset of that, um, then the conditions ascribed to matter are not permanent, they're not perfect, and therefore aren't really all that important. Um, I think most modern Gnostics probably would fall more towards, if you had a, a linear scale between celibacy and licentiousness, I think more of them would fall towards the licentiousness uh, end of things. I think all modern Gnostic, Gnostic clergy um, in the major Gnostic churches are able to be married. And uh, it's, but I think that it can also be seen as a distraction. You know, and as with all things of matter, there's a lot of stuff that's kind of just designed to keep you thinking about matter things. You know, mm -hmm. you gotta you gotta eat. You know, I'm a little bit hungry right now. Maybe I'm not thinking about you know the the ineffable. <laughs> you know, <laughs> geez, you know she's really hot. Maybe I go and get her number. And, oh no, I'm not praying right now. Okay, so and again, it's depending. There's a lot of different views of thought on where people fall on the line between matter spirit dualism as well you know there's all kinds of uh, there's all kinds of uh, pretty hardcore radical dualists out there today and then there's a whole bunch of um, qualified monists and <laughs> you know mitigated dualists and uh, you know just you can throw all kinds of fun words at it but um, but anyway the, the, the basic uh, thing is I don't think we have too many people today uh, too many modern Gnostics today who are 
very who are you know you have to be a vegetarian, you have to be celibate, you have to do this kind of thing. I don't think that's an invalid way to approach it. I, I think actually that would be a fairly smart way to approach it for people who have the stomach for it. I think I would probably lump myself in with St. Paul in that category, you know. Um, but again, it, if it it too can be a distraction, as we talked about in our centering prayer uh, workshop a couple of weeks back, the the aesthetic practice in and of itself can be a barrier to spirituality. Um, so, well, you can fall you can fall into the trap of scrupulosity in that respect, you know. But you can, you can become so self-critical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. So again, your mileage may vary, um, yeah. but uh, but anyway, so it's not yeah. really a big danger this in this day and age. Scrupulosity. Most folks, <laughs> most, yeah. folks yeah. most folks, most folks go the opposite extreme and find reasons not to do work. Right. Or not Absolutely. To, right. Or not to obey rules. Right. Yeah. 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 It's it, people are people, and it's yeah. it's a condition of, of our existence here in the cosmos. The, sure. You know that it's it's hard to be a spiritual being. Yeah. It's just hard. You know, and there's lots of stuff out there that can distract you. It's how you deal with those things that matter. Okay, I would be, I would be chastised on the internet if I did not mention <laughs> in great detail the Da Vinci Code and the Holy Blood, Holy Grail kind of. Was Jesus married? I don't know. And and were his descendants blonde haired, blue eyed Arabs? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Probably not. Palestinian yeah. couple who gave birth to blonde hair, blue eyes. Uh, yeah. Strange things have warriors, happened, but right. um, yeah, like that. But anyway, that really happened, yeah. So <laughs> Dan Brown. All right, so let's talk about the Da Vinci Code. Dan Brown gets his ideas from the Holy Blood, Holy Grail, um, which is an interesting bit of speculative history. Uh, you know, and when they sued him on it, he blamed his wife. Yeah, I don't know anything about that, but um, whose name was Sophia. <laughs> but anyway, so Dan Brown, by way of Holy Blood, Holy Grail, asserts that this bridal chamber ritual was a fertility ritual, um, somewhat semi-private sex cult, you know, uh, eyes wide shut kind of thing happening in some old rich dude's house. Um, and then this is a, this was the sacrament handed down by Jesus to all of the elect. Um, <clears throat> I can't recall if he actually says the word Gnostic in his book. I I kind of think that he didn't actually say that the Gnostics do this, but it was certainly implied. And it, yeah, they refer to the Gospel of Philip, certainly. Yeah, well, right, because they talk about the smooching of, in the Gospel of Philip. So you know, you come to that if you've ever if you've if you read the Da Vinci Code, like I did, and were curious about where all of this stuff came from, then you look up the Gospel of Philip and you find out it was Gnostic, and you go, oh, well, I guess the Gnostics were, you know, getting it on and all freaky. Um, <laughs> so, so anyway, so he also asserts that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married and that they had children, and these children would later become French. And, and <laughs> It would be some it's a not just French, but the French kings, and that the French kings are actually descendants of Jesus. This doesn't sound at all like propaganda. Not even a little bit. Um, and their secret organization is ready to unveil Otto von Habsburg or somebody as the heir of Christ. Right? Yes, yes, absolutely. And so that's yeah. very important. So that's kind of the, that's kind of that in a nutshell and I, I don't like to make fun because I did enjoy the Da Vinci Code I thought it was a pretty entertaining book for, for what it was worth and, and it did eventually lead to me being here today um, but the, the the insistence upon literalism I think is something that most Gnostics would just kind of scoff at in the original version of the book which I got like in the mid 80s when it first came out The Holy Blood Holy Grail mm -hmm. Not only do they do the Jesus and Mary Magdalene Aryan racist bloodline thing, they also include in the last chapter the uh, sacred mushroom theory. Oh, that of the bread of life was a sacred mushroom. Yeah. They took that out in later editions. I guess they figured they had enough crazy already. <laughs> <laughs> but the mushroom thing was part of the original, original yeah. tale. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> What do, uh, there are some groups that are kind of on the periphery of what we might call Gnosticism that have a sex magic kind of component to them. Um, 
admittedly, this is not my area of expertise, but the, the, if one were here, he might be able to tell yes. us a little bit more. But there are, the, in, in the Thelemic tradition, Thelema, there is a sex magic component sure. to that. Um, in the sense that the, the belief, I think, and the, from my understanding of it, that the, there is a lot of energy in the body that is produced during orgasm and that that energy can be harnessed and used towards uh, magical acts. Um, again, I'm not a Thelemite, I don't really know. Uh, Google is your friend if you're interested in that. I'm sure that there's uh, lots of good sites out there about that. In fact, uh, Thomas found one the other day and as we were discussing this document and linked it to me. It was, it was fairly interesting. Um, there's also something, and I hesitate to even mention it because, well, I'm gonna anyway. <laughs> <laughs> There's something called the Gnostic movement, the international Gnostic movement, and uh, is it Samael? Um, yeah, uh, Samael uh, and we're yep. we are war. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Uh, who was a South American um, teacher, uh, mystic, some would say, um, who developed kind of a system of spirituality that is. Well, it calls itself Gnostic, but I don't really see any Gnosticism in it. Just from from my own point of view, I don't really have, uh, you know, what, what can I say? <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not a member of the group, and I don't know, uh, I don't know really what they do, but from, but they, they sure do have a hold on the internet. If you Google Gnostic, oh, yeah. you're going to run across them. And well, uh, they, they teach sort of the opposite end of sex magic. Which yes, is that, that right. the, um, um, the sex act without um, actual ejaculation sends that energy up into the, you know, the Kundalini or uh, and, or and can be used for enlightenment. Yeah. Didn't the Unity also try that? Uh, I don't know. And it sounds more like Tantra. Sure, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, it, 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 it's possible that he yeah. had connection with Tantra. I mean, yeah. he was only doing this 50 years ago. It wasn't really, uh, yeah. you know, a, a thing. I don't know, 50 years ago. It's yeah. just a number I pulled out of my head. But um, but anyway, so that's out there as well. And, and there's certainly a sexual component to the, the magic that they're doing. And they use the word Gnostic. So, you know, there you have it. Let the flames begin. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, I think that's pretty much everything that I was hoping to cover. Uh, I will now field your hundreds of questions. I just want to, I, I wanted to mention two points. One is that the, um, the Valentinians, um, going back to the issue of uh, androgyny, um, the uh, Valentinians actually saw the fall as um, occurring with the separation of Adam and Eve. Mm. It was a separation of that primal unity, and, and the scripture says when Eve was an Adam, there wasn't death, but when they separated, death entered the world, mm -hmm. which takes us full circle to both their attitude towards sex and procreation, which was on the whole positive, but also towards their their salvation, which, which, which culminated in the bridal chamber. And we now know from contemporary notes that the bridal chamber didn't involve any sacred sex magic. It was the... It was a, a, a complete ritual involving the redemption. And the, the Apollo Tros is the laying on hands, um, anointing the oil, uh, culminating in a, in a prayer for the descent of the, of the angel. And of course, the angel was male, and the psyche of the soul was always seen, with one of those seven, was always seen as female. So the bridal chamber was the unification of her psyche with the spiritual, with this pleromic counterpart. Um, which sort of undid that original separation. Mm -hmm. And your second point? That was my second point. <laughs> I wasn't listening. Okay. <clears throat> All right, well then if there's nothing else, um, just wanted to uh, make some announcements about some upcoming stuff. Um, so, okay, Wednesday night, 9 p.m., talk Gnosis. We're going to be talking about the Valentinians. And Thomas is all kinds of expert on the Valentinians, so he's going to... I'm just going to sit there and shut up, and he's going to talk, and it's going to be great. Um, next month, here, on the third Sunday of the month, which is July, if you're watching this recorded, um, you, uh, we have Greg Kaminsky, host of the Occult of Personality podcast. He's going to be talking to us about um, esotericism in colonial Pennsylvania. 
there were two specific groups that he likes to talk about. In fact, he wrote a paper for his um, his uh, doctorate or graduate degree. I can't remember what she's doing. Um, about these uh, these two colonial uh, German Pietist groups who came to America to escape religious persecution and were largely Rosicrucian in their outlook. And so he's going to talk to us about that. Um, I've, I've heard him talk about this a couple of times. Super interesting topic. Um, Is that the woman in the wilderness? The woman in the wilderness, yes. And Peter Lamborn Wilson also has a bit of research mm -hmm. on that. I think he drew a lot from, from that when he was writing his paper. But anyway, not only is the topic super interesting, but Greg is a fantastic guy, and you really should come and see him. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, his podcast is, is second to none for <coughs> occult information. So if you're interested in the occult and esoteric traditions, the Occult of Personality <coughs> podcast, definitely, definitely worth checking out uh, and subscribing to and listening to as many back episodes as you possibly can. Uh, and then before that lecture, um, from 10 a.m. to 1, a 1 p.m., uh, 10 a.m. to 1 a.m., that'll be fine. <laughs> no, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, with uh, God's Love We Deliver, which I didn't put the address down here, but you can uh, we'll find it on our... Put it up on the address. Yeah, you can... 166 Avenue in the Americas. Yep. So, yeah. um, we are going to be volunteering as a group in their kitchen. We're going to be cooking meals. Well, likely we'll be peeling potatoes or something mm -hmm. for the meals. Uh, Just fine. For um, people who, are, uh, who have chronic illnesses who cannot uh, cook the meals for themselves. So it's a great charity, and yes. we're happy to be a part of it. Uh, and we're going to be doing that every third Sunday of the month before our lecture. So from here on into perpetuity, uh, that's where you'll find us on the third Sunday of the month at 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And then we're going to hoof it back here for our lecture. All smelling like carrots. Okay. Bring your apron. So for all of this and more, you can find us on gnosticnyc.com slash schedule.php for all of the details. Uh, if you are, if you would like to donate, if you are here in person, there's a jar over here. And that page also has the link to your eHarmony profile. To my eHarmony profile. <laughs> please, please visit my eHarmony profile because I am not celibate. Uh, <laughs> well, I am, but not for our purpose. Okay, so how to donate. Uh, if you would like to donate to us online, please visit gnosticnyc.com. Halfway down the page on the left-hand side is a blue button that says support us. Please do. It helps us to uh, buy equipment for the show, to bring in great guests, and all of that stuff. Let's see. So if you enjoyed this show, please share it with your friends online. I'm talking to you. Uh, press the like button and subscribe to our channel, and you'll be notified every time we put something up. Uh, Bishop Thomas and I are available for lectures. To learn, to learn more, please visit GnosticNYC.com slash staff.php. Opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily re represent the views of Gnostic NYC or any other organization, and no ha animals were harmed during the production of this show. Uh, and again, find us online, GnosticNYC.com, and uh, you will get all of our important details and social medias and all of that there. Thank you very much, and have and a good day. <laughs>